Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 21. The message today is, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Here's a great question for you as you turn there. A great question. How can, we've all probably asked this question before. How can we know what the will of the Lord is? And here's a greater question. If you could know the will of the Lord precisely, are you ready and willing to obey it? That's a greater question. James 1 in verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liber- liberally and with, with reproach, and it will be given to him. Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6 uh, uh, tells us to trust in the Lord. One of my favorite verses, with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Over in John chapter 16 and verse 33, it says, These things I have spoken to you, Jesus talking, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Sometimes making decisions that we know to be God's will will and can be difficult. Discovering the will of God appears at times like a maze through which we have to walk. But as God's children, we can be assured of his guidance through the maze. This account of Paul's journey here as we uh, are continuing the book of Acts in chapter 21, his journey to Jerusalem, it really provides, I believe, an excellent opportunity to learn about God's will. So if you're physically able, I'd ask you to stand as we honor the inspired and erred infallible word of God this morning. Acts chapter 21, we'll read down through verses 14 this morning. It says, now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria and landed in Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding the disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Uh, when he had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accomp- accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when he had finished our vo- when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to to uh, Potamus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. And on the next day, uh, we we who were with Paul's who were with Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied, and we stayed many days. And a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we had heard these things, both we and those, this is Luke speaking here, uh, those that in that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? I'm telling you, I can understand Paul's words there. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. God, encourage us this morning that following after you is the best thing we could do, regardless of where that leads us. For we pray it in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. The simple takeaway is uh, this message is God's will is the best plan for our lives. There is no better plan than God's will for our lives. So this morning, I want just for a few minutes before we partake of the Lord's Supper, I want to speak on the subject of the will of God. Now, the first thing we see here is the will of the Lord can lead to difficult partings. Uh, 
it can lead to difficult partings. He says he came there, that they had departed from them. He ran a straight course to where he was headed. Now, ever since uh, the riot in Ephesus that we talked about several weeks back, Paul realizes that his end was probably coming to an end. And even last week, we see the, uh, the Ephesian elders there when they had been in Miletus meeting Paul there. He no longer is planning churches. Uh, he was there in Miletus uh, to, to leave there to go to Jerusalem, which was about 610 miles away. And Paul is headed as straight as he can head to Jerusalem. And he says here, remember the Bible tells us in Acts 20 that he was bound in the spirit, that there's a conviction that he has to go. And here he's leaving Miletus where he gave the farewell address that we went through the last three weeks. And the Bible says, now it came to pass that when we had departed from them. When you study that word departed, it means to tear away. That shows the trauma of that parting. It literally means he had to tear himself away from friends that he had been there ministering with for three years. That phrase also is used in Luke 22, the same phrase, the same wording to speak of our Lord tearing himself away from his disciples in Gethsemane there. And so it speaks of a love bond. It speaks of something that is really hard to do physically to sever your relationship or sever the, the presence of one another to continue on in the journey that God has given. I've been there before. I've had to depart places that it was hard for me to leave because of the love that I had for the people that I had served. I understand Paul's heart here. It's hard when there's a bond of Christian love that's united us together to have to leave that and go to somewhere else. And that's what's happening here. The love that united the early Christians was strong. It speaks of love. It speaks of unity. It speaks of fellowship. Did y'all know it's difficult sometimes to, to leave a place that you love? It's difficult to leave a people that you love. It can be difficult to leave. Sometimes it can be difficult because people just don't get why you're leaving. I'll never forget one church that I left uh, that I served, it was probably, I don't know, nine, ten months I served as an interim and I was leaving. And one gentleman said, I just don't understand it. I just don't think the Lord's calling you to leave us. You've been, you've been so good to us and you've been good for us. And it, it, it was hard to hear a man say that. And, and, uh, you know, ladies cry and it bothers me. When men cry, it tears me up. You know what I mean? And this guy's crying. He's a burly guy, too. I mean, he ain't a, you know, he ain't a, he ain't a weak looking man. He's a burly guy. It's hard. How many of us has had to do that to follow after the Lord? I'll tell you something else that is hard to do when the will of God takes you and may cause a difficult parting. Family, friends, co workers sometimes, church members sometimes. That you have to leave them behind spiritually. They just don't get or don't want the same passion to follow the Lord. The same desire to know the Lord in his word. And you have to leave them behind. Not physically leave them. But spiritually leave them behind. That you have to continue to grow in your walk. You cannot let them hold you back from doing all that God's called you to do. I'm telling you, the will of God will lead you to difficult parting sometimes. It'll be hard to part. But can I tell you, you got to leave when God tells you to leave, no matter how difficult it is to part. I'll tell you something else about the will of the Lord. It can lead to the determined priority. I, I, this encourages me with Paul in verses 4 through 6. He says, finding disciples there, we stayed and, 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 and we had come to the end of these days and they were about to depart and all them people said, hey, you can't go, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. There's three important viewpoints I think we all ought to have concerning the will of God. First, we must recognize that God's will is real. 
It's not a fairy tale. There is a will that God has. He actually has a plan. I was telling the, the high school the schoolers th this morning. He has a plan for each and every person's life. I know there's an overarching theme of the Bible that our lives are to glorify God. So all of us have a calling on our lives to glorify the Lord, to come to know him as Savior and to glorify him. We understand that. But I believe wholeheartedly that God has a specific purpose and will for every single person. Uh, Paul knew this uh, in, verses, uh, in verse 15 of chapter 9 and he acted upon it. Uh, listen to the, to the verse here. Uh, when the Lord is, is, is talking uh, to Ananias that, that's, that needs to come and, and, and help Paul, right after the road to Damascus, he says, the Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine and my name. If you just go back over there to Acts 9, uh, Paul has come, to, he's, 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 he's been arrested by the Lord Jesus Christ right there on the road to Damascus, right? And in verse 15, uh, there's, there's, there's Ananias is come as, as someone that the God has put in this place. And he says, he answers Ananias, answers, Lord, I have heard from many about this man who much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And here's how the Lord answers. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Paul had a purpose in, 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 that God had placed on his life. And here, right here, he says, hey, go. Hey, he's, he's the chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I'll show, look, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. There's a determined that we have to understand there is a real thing when it comes to God's will for our lives personally. Second, we got to recognize that God's will can and may be refused. People may refuse the will of God for their lives. Each person also has a will. God gave us a will. God gave us the power to choose. Consequently, we can choose to leave him out of our lives. And I've watched that happen. But our ability to choose does not, does not limit God's power. He still can do anything he chooses to do. And the third thing we've we got to recognize when it comes to God's will, he's always right. He's always right. So if you head in the wrong direction, it ain't because he told you to go that way. And so there's a portrait here of Paul here uh, that this passage seems to magnify a conviction that presupposes a clear purpose for his life. Now, this seems so clear to Paul that it gave him the courage and confidence to move forward regardless. It's a portrait of a man driven to fulfill the priority of his call. Did you know this? If everyone on planet Earth is pleased with you and yet God is not pleased, you have failed. Everybody could be with you, but if God ain't with you, it won't matter. On conversely, if God is pleased and nobody else is, you succeeded because pleasing him is all that matters. I'm telling you, I've, I've, I've nailed down my whole ministry to this. It don't matter who's satisfied with me as long as God is satisfied with me. Y'all all right? So I tell people all the time, I'm serving the Lord. I work for the Lord. I don't work for this church. I work for the Lord. And so it just so happens that working for this church is his will as I work for him. And so follow the Lord's will, even when it's very hard. That's what Paul's doing here. Words that begin to come our way once we decide to do the will of God. Here's a few words. Challenge. Let me give you some counsel. <laughs> I've had that one before, as if they're going to tell me something better than the Lord's already told me. Good night. Clarity. Let me give you some clarity on that. I'm telling you right now, when somebody tells you they've heard from the Lord for your life better than you've heard, you need to not listen to them. Not one word. Amen. Conviction. Confidence, courage. And so finding these disciples, we stayed there seven days. Then they told Paul through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. Now, are these believers, are they well-intended? They absolutely are. Yes, they are. They're well-intended. Are they nearsighted? Yes, they are. Are they seeing the, th same, are they seeing the things the way the Lord sees them? Uh, no. They're looking at this and saying, Paul, we don't want you to lose your life. You don't have to do this to show your love for the Lord. See, what they've seen, the Lord said, don't go to Jerusalem. To them, but he's convicted Paul 
you got to go to Jerusalem. Right? What they're doing is this. Their thoughts is channeled through the grid of their own fears and their own concern for Paul's safety and security. And so remember that when someone tells you, I just don't believe that's God's will for your life. When you know 100% God's calling you to do something. And when he calls you to do something, always understand it'll be within the confines of his word too. He won't tell you to do something that's outside of the bounds of his word. That's when wise counsel can come in and say, God didn't call you to do that because that's contrary to what God's word says. Now, you need to listen to that. So they go on and they pray for him. Look, when we come to the end of the days, they didn't, they're not going to be able to persuade Paul not to go. So they decide, hey, we need to encourage him. So they go, all of them, not just a part of, it says they all accompanied us, wives and children. They went down and knelt and prayed. And then Paul boarded. Now, you see the love that they have for Paul here. Everyone went down. Paul had heard from the Lord concerning the will for his life. This conviction that Paul had here. His conviction, what was it? For several years, he had been collecting money to give to the poor saints there in Jerusalem at the church. He had collected it from all the Gentile churches, and it had a twofold project here. It was a twofold project. One, to show the Gentile churches, uh, to show the the Gentile churches love the Jewish church and to unite the church into one to show them, hey, these Gentiles love y'all. And then two, to meet the needs, practically the money needs of the poor saints there because uh, the courage and conviction that he had, these people were struggling financially. So Paul lived in such a way. We know by scripture, Paul lived in such a way that he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. Just let me give you a few scriptures to prove that. Acts 16. Uh, we talked about it about a month or two ago uh, in verse seven, uh, 6 and 7. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And they had come to uh, Messia. They tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Paul listened to the Holy Spirit. If you go on down to the next uh, verse there in, in, in Acts 16, uh, in verse 9 through 10, and as a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over here to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So the Holy Spirit never prohibited Paul from going to Jerusalem. He did warn him, but he didn't forbid him. In Acts 20, 22, and he talks about 20, uh, verse 20, uh, 22 and 23 of Acts 20. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit. We talked about that a couple weeks. Not knowing the things that will happen to me there. But the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. Paul knew what was coming. Paul saw his ministry as one the Lord gave him. We see that in verse 24 of Acts 20. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I received this from the Lord Jesus Christ, and so therefore I got to go. Paul's conscience was clear too. Acts 23 and 1, we'll get there in a little bit, maybe about three weeks or so. Uh, then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, men, brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He goes on and says it in Acts 24 as well in verse 16. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. So Paul knew the will of God for his life, and it was to go to Jerusalem. The will of God will lead us to a determined priority if we'll just follow his will, seek his will, and surrender to it. We'll be determined to follow it. If you'll seek it with all your heart and ask him to give you the strength, to follow no matter where it leads. But I want to camp out just for a second and then we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper on this last one. The will of the Lord can lead to dangerous places. Verses 7 through 14 shares with us what's going to really happen there when he gets to Jerusalem. But oh how God works in this. Only him by the way can do this. We see in this, pas in this particular section of the passage in verse seven, verses 7 through 14 he comes to this place, and lo and behold, Philip's going to host him. Now, what had happened 20 years before this? I'll tell you what happened. 20 years before this, Philip, Philip had been driven from Jerusalem by the persecution the church endured, much by the hands of Saul. Remember, Saul used to be, it was Paul used to be Saul. And so uh, it's interesting here that now Philip's going to host him. See, Stephen had been martyred there, and, and, and the persecution continued until the church scattered. Thereby, these people went everywhere preaching the word. And amongst those scattered was Philip. And Philip went down to Samaria and preached there. Now 20 years had passed, and now 
Philip is hosting the very man who was the particularly the problem they're leading the persecution is certainly one of the persecutions and probably the chief one. He's hosting Paul. Only God can do that. Only God. Verse 10 through 11 here, we see some prophecy here. It's interesting. Uh, Peter in the Pentecost sermon pointed to the prophesying of daughters as a sign of the gift of the Spirit in the last days over in Acts 2. But here, Agabus brings the prophecy. It's delivered by him in a symbolic, in really a symbolic act, much like the acted out prophecies of the Old Testament. Uh, prophets, Agabus predicted Paul's coming arrest in Jerusalem. He took Paul's girdle, that long cloth that would be wrapped around his waist multiple times, and he bound with it his hands and his feet. And just like an Old Testament prophet, he gave the interpretation of the act. Paul was going to be bound by the Jews in Jerusalem and handed over to the Gentiles. This is a parallel, by the way, to the fate of Jesus Christ. Now, in fact, there's a lot of parallels when you look at Paul headed to Jerusalem. And when Christ headed to Jerusalem. But this wasn't so much as a warning on Agabus' part as it was a prediction. Unlike the Christians of Tyre, he didn't urge Paul not to go. No, rather he told him, here's what's in store for you when you get there. He's almost trying to encourage him, stay the course, brother. See, Agabus' act here prepared Paul for the events to come and assured him of God's presence in those events. God will be with you when you follow his will and his will leads you into dangerous places. We all know the story of Jim Elliott following the will of God. We all know his story on January the 8th, 1956. He was attempting to make contact with the very people he was going to minister to there. The Aka Indians or the Wadani tribe and Jim and four other missionaries were speared to death that day, slain by the very people that God had called them to minister to. You say, was that God's will? It was absolutely God's will to go there because when you read and listen to the rest of the story, his wife would settle in right there and she literally would be a part of the chief of the tribe that killed her husband coming to know the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. God's will will lead you into difficult places. Go anyway. Follow the will of God and lead you to dangerous places. I'll tell you something else it'll lead you to. It'll lead you to difficult places. It'll lead you to difficult. It'll lead you to desperate places. It'll lead you to some difficult places. Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? That phrase there, breaking my heart, means to crush together. A word was often used of washing clothes referred to pounding them with a stone in order to whiten them up. It crushed Paul, crushed his heart that they were fearful for his safety. And Paul wants, knows his finish line is near. Following the Lord's will for your life will lead you to difficult places and dangerous places. You say, Terry, how do you know that? I'll tell you. 23 years ago, I surrendered to, to ministry, a call that God had placed on my life 12 years prior. I, like Jonah, ran. I, like Jonah, eventually get to the place where the Lord was going to get me anyway. And I can tell you, following the Lord's calls brought me some difficult places. Nothing like Paul's going to go through but difficult places. You say, how so, Terry? Serving the Lord is not easy. Pastoring folks aren't easy. It ain't easy. When you know the grief that 130 people have, when you bear weight on your shoulders, for that grief because you love them so much. When you lay in the bed when you wake up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and you know that there's marriages that aren't where they need to be, relationships that are strained, and it burdens you. When I surrendered to the call on my life, 
when I knelt down at Cornerstone Baptist Church on a Sunday night in February. I wasn't thinking about that kind of call. But over the years, the burdens and the weightiness of understanding what people go through in life, whether they brought the situation on themselves or not, doesn't matter. Your love for people doesn't change because they brought a bad thing into their life or not. And the very first time, and I can't remember it, but the first time that I realized, uh uh-oh, ministry going to be hard. I thank God to this day that that first time that it was hard didn't make me quit. It just made me get after it even more. Doing God's will will lead you to difficult places. When you choose to follow, understand he's going with you, but it ain't going to be easy always. When you've prayed for people and prayed for people and prayed for people and prayed for people, And nothing seems to change. That's heavy on your heart. Don't stop praying though. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. Crush Paul. They're missing the greater truth here. They're trying to detour his trip. And Paul says, I can't detour. If I detour, I'm not going to be where the Lord has called me to be. And I'll be outside of his will. That's why Paul stays the course. The Lord had ordained. Paul wasn't looking at the pain. Paul's looking at the promise. He's looking at the promise. And the promise uh, would happen with his following of the Lord's will. See, the Bible says much about God's will. We're to seek it. We see that in Matthew 6. Uh, we are to surrender to his will. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6. And we're to follow his will. We see that in Colossians chapter 4. I heard Johnny Hunt say one time, if you want to follow the will of God, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. It's a good word. The passage ends, so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased. Luke's writing this, we ceased. Thy will of the Lord be done. Let the will of the Lord be done. Have we heard that before? Who said that? Jesus. Almost the exact same thing when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Christ is our greatest example. He followed the will of the Father all the way to the cross. May you and I know the will of God for our lives. Surrender to it and follow it. Can I tell you there's blessing? When you do, no matter how hard it is. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening to this online message from Living Water Baptist Church. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is preached, it demands a response. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 24, that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like a person who built their house on a solid foundation. So if there's a decision you know of that you need to make in response to this message, would you let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org? Whether it's the need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you need to follow through on your salvation and be baptized, or you wanna join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership, or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, we want to hear from you. So please email us at decision at lwbctriad.org so that we can better minister to you. For more information about Living Water Baptist Church, be sure to visit us online. You can check out our website at www.lwbctriad.org or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad.
Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us online, and we hope to see you in person this coming Sunday.